All this is Dr. Mobeen from drbean.com. Hope you are doing good. This is the best time of the week when I have heart to heart with you when we are doing one on one. So this is my favorite day today. We are going to do some uh, open forum things. Thank you very much for uh, for your questions. These are excellent questions, beautiful questions. And I was I was laughing. I, I was chuckling when I was looking at those questions that the cool beans have such a deep understanding that the questions that are coming are so interesting and intriguing. So thank you very much for those questions. And let us start our discussion. Hopefully, everybody is doing good. So we have uh, Dr. Husseini, we have Claire Robinson, Shelley, DLG, Jim, um, Claire, Paul, Chantel, and there'll be more folks who'll be joining. So thank you very much. So let's start. I'm going to share my screen and we'll go through the questions. Today are really, really interesting questions. So I think we'll all have um, good value out of them. So just in general, how is everyone doing? Hey, Margaret, thank you very much for joining. Good evening. OK, so <clears throat> starting here with the, so I think uh, you would agree that the folks who have put their questions here on Twitter before, I should uh, answer those questions. And then I'm going to look at the stream here as well. My request to everyone is that if you have a question in the comment stream, please write something like Q or question. There are so many comments. Uh, the system aggregates the Facebook. There are two Facebook channels I'm live on right now and YouTube. So it aggregates all of those comments and puts them together. So it becomes difficult to find the questions from there. So just please my request that put the word question with the with your comment here. So all right, let's start. So very first question here, considering plasma half-life of ivermectin, which is only approximately 18 hours, following oral administration, do you think it is a good candidate for prophylaxis? So this is a very, very good question. And I have a couple of more folks who have asked me this as well. So my first comment is that I am seeing ivermectin actually being even more efficacious than hydroxy. So in terms of the way how fast it works and in terms of the side effects, it is actually, uh, I am finding it to be much more efficacious. Please remember, once again, I'll keep saying it, it is contraindicated in people with the compromised blood-brain barrier, um, for example, patients with meningitis or uh, pregnant women who may have, who have children, or fetus who is still developing and the blood-brain barrier is still not fully uh, formed. Then lactating mothers, because even the ch children who are born still have their blood-brain barriers being uh, developed. So uh, it is contraindicated in, in such cases. So please don't uh, don't take it without your doctor's prescription. Now, answering the question here, the plasma half-life is 18 hours. So yes, definitely for prophylaxis, this drug should be taken every other day. If it is not taken every other day, then of course, its half-life is uh, uh, 18 hours. So it starts losing its therapeutic dose. So that is the question. Good question. Willow Desk says, if quercetin is same as hydroxychloroquine in its mechanism, does it also have the side effects of people with retinal heart issues? So no, quercetin is a zinc ionophore. And so the hydroxychloroquine has its own action on retina and on other parts, for example, blood and, uh, and the heart. So quercetin does not have those. So then there is a continuation of this question. If not, why isn't being talked about more in mainstream news, any ongoing studies involving quercetin and zinc? So I'm not aware of any studies, but you are correct that quercetin should be talked more because it does have a very potent effect. The only question is, what is the right dose of the quercetin with zinc? And as you're saying, are there any studies? I do not know if there are any studies specifically for quercetin and zinc. Very good question. It is actually a very potent uh, ionophore as well. Leon Holloway says, with this week's studies on the bodies, different immune pathways for those infected with coronavirus, how does those findings impact the new therapies coming through from lironlimab and abiptadil? Does it give support as to how these drugs might be useful? So absolutely correct. <clears throat> Look, so for, for the whole discussion today, I'm going to just very quickly draw this, that what we are... We sh what we should keep in our mind is that the immune system 
or the phases of this uh, disease are two. And there are a couple of more questions that would utilize this concept. So I'm just going to do that over here. And I know that cool beans are aware of these. One phase is the viral phase where the virus itself is replicating and increasing. So in this phase, the drugs that should act on our body should be those that would kill the virus itself or stop its replication. Then is the immune phase where the virus itself is not the main player. It is our immune system that has become dysregulated and is causing harm. So in this phase, of course, the antivirals are not effective. In this phase, those drugs that would immunomodulate our system or suppress our immune system, if you are going in a cytokine storm, those drugs will be needed. So when, when we are talking about studies with the uh, antibodies being present or cytotoxic T cells being present. These are all fine studies. However, once the immune system has become dysregulated, then it is important to use drugs like Avipradil or Lironlimab or other drugs as well. So I hope that that clarifies this question. Next question is, do you think it's safe enough to send young adults back to school? My, ch my children are 15 to 17 years. We are living in England where the number of COVID-19 have been dreadful. So uh, I think I have been very, very clear on my uh, point of view about the children going back to school. And my point of view is no. And the reason for that is very simple. Yes, we know that, <clears throat> excuse me, that children are actually better protected or better tolerant, I should say. They can, they, there are a few things. Number one, they can be super spreaders. Children can be super spreaders. Number two, children actually do become infected and they do develop cytokine storm as well. And the death rate in children is about 0.2%, which means one child every out of every 500 children who are infected. Now, I have said this before as well. I did a, uh, so uh, to Emily, Emily, I have done a complete lecture about should children go back to school or not. And uh, over there, I said this as well, that look, when we say one child out of 500, this is not something that we should say this is okay. Whose child, who would be saying that fine, out of 500 children, my child is okay to, to die? Nobody is going to do that. Uh, people give their own lives to protect their children. So I am very passionate about this one topic, and I'm very, very uh, um, strongly of the opinion that children should not be sent to school. Look, we are reaching a point where very soon we'll have COVID-19 go away. We'll have vaccines, herd immunities are developing. Uh, this is not the time to then take a risk on the child's life. So that is my opinion. Um, I know that politics is different. I know that uh, health, uh, health administrations are different. They have their own point of views. Uh, they can decide to open the schools or not. My opinion is no. And I'm very clear about my no. Even if you hate me for this, I know that you are not, but there are some folks who send me messages that they don't like my opinion or this stance of mine, but I am very clear on this one. Then there is a question from covid.us.org. The study says SARS-CoV-2 attack immune system, and then they have shown this study over here. And this is a very interesting study. I actually... Um, used this study over here as well. So uh, let me see where it is. Yeah, so this is the study um, they were referencing in the question. What this study says is very interesting. And for the cool beans here, one part of immunology that I have never discussed, and we have talked about immunology so much, I have never discussed one part, and that part is the complement system. And that is really part of inflammation and immunology system. So maybe tomorrow we should talk about the complement system. Complement system and the acute phase proteins. These are the two topics that we have just touched upon. Complement we have never talked about. This particular study, what this says is that when SARS-CoV-2 is when it arrives in our body, SARS-CoV-2 have has, so let's say this is our cell. Inside the cell, let's say the coronavirus RNA arrives in our cell. This RNA produces some enzymes. We know that it produces RDRP, but in addition to that, it produces more enzymes as well. For example, NSP3 and NSP5. These are the two enzymes that are of the coronavirus. These two enzymes, NSP3 
NSP3 and NSP5, they cause destruction of some of our immune proteins, immune proteins. And that destruction in turn causes the immune system to become dysregulated. And because I have not talked about the immune proteins, this forum for quick question and answers is not the right forum. So if, if the cool beans want, tomorrow's lecture we can do about the complement and I can discuss this study as well. Generally, what this study is saying, that what they see is that the SARS-CoV enzyme, they destroy the interferon producing proteins and other defense proteins of the immune system, which causes the immune system to function less. So this is the um, very interesting study. So if I go back here to the comment here from COVID US. So yes, uh, your question uh, or your comment over here, this is correct. If SARS-CoV is doing this, that would also cause immune system suppression or dysregulation. So we should talk more about it. Very, very good comment. Leon Holloway says, if one has had an antibody test thinking I've had COVID-19, but it came, came up negative, what kind of test would one need to order to confirm alternate immunity? So again, what she is referencing is the following. We have been saying that it is possible that innate arm in some people, especially children, is sufficient to take care of the immune, uh, take care of the virus. Then we know that in majority, at least the ones we know, T helper two pathway and the B cell pathway that produces antibodies that pathway is activated. We also know that now T helper one pathway is also activated that goes towards cytotoxic T cells. Now, <clears throat> the question she's saying is the following. She's saying, if we come up with the antibody negative, what is the way to see maybe if my immune system innate arm had taken care of the things, or what is the way to know if the cytotoxic T cells or T helper one pathway had become activated? So the short answer is there are no good tests for that area. So far, the studies, these folks, what they do is they collect the cells, then they, they put them in special equipment, and then they look at the markers of the cell. And from there, they figure out the density of what kind of cells are more. And then we, they put the viral proteins in that equipment then they see which kind of cells are reacting to them. So that to do that at scale for all of us, I think it is difficult. I would love if such a test uh, system is established that can look at, so a testing protocol is established that can look at the innate arms behavior, that can look at the antibodies behavior, and that can look at the cytotoxic T cells behavior. If all of these three things are measured, it would actually be awesome for us to know that was I infected or not. Unfortunately, there is no decent, inexpensive, quick test for the other two parts. So Leon, I hope that uh, answers that question. Roshan says, question in Indian subcontinent, we eat with hands and aren't much concerned with hygiene. Could this lead to higher exposure to all viruses in general and due to which have innate immunity pathway activated usually instead of humoral, which could explain lower mortality. So uh, both answers, there are two answers to this. One is that, of course, when we uh, eat with hands, the orofecal transmission chances are increased. So there is a chance for greater spread. At the same time, you are correct that if hands are being used and the hands are dirty, and then we are um, bringing in infections and viruses and pathogens. Maybe our immune system is a little better trained, but this can actually be very risky as well. It is also very clear that immune system or people who are cleaner, relatively cleaner, uh, or have hygienic habits, they are actually better protected. As we can see with nowadays, wash your hands, stay away, wear masks. These are all hygienic habits, and they have an effect. So uh, I. I do not know if the lower mortality can be tied to uh, being slightly less hygienic. <laughs> this is Kairi. So Kairi is sleeping over here. And in her sleep, she is, I think, dreaming and uh, making these noises. OK, so then is this Cindy Glasgow. So Cindy Glasgow says, how do you make the natural killer cells get up and go to their job reliably? What shuts them down and how to start them up? This is such a beautiful question. 
So, uh, Cindy, uh, thank you very much for this question. If I wanted to give an award for the best question over here, which which offered uh, value to all of us cool beans, this is that question. And I have a couple of studies over here. One study, and all of these studies have the links in the description. So you can please, uh, if you like, go and see them. One is one is turning on natural killer cells. And this one, this study discusses more in terms of when we get infected, how our natural killer cells work. However, there is another study I have uh, put over here, which is excellent. I love this one. And I'm just going to go over the summary of this. Here they're talking about how the NK cells can be activated by foods and supplements. And the food and supplements that they have talked about over here are the following. Number one, they talk about water soluble extracts of dried Brazilian sun or agaricus blasi and mitaki. So these are two substances that can help activate the NK cells. Then vitamin E, 250 milligram daily for two weeks can enhance NK cell function. Then if they continue, they talked about, um, let's see here. Here, if you see dietary supplementation of mushroom powders, button mushroom powder has been seen to activate the natural killer cells as well. Beautiful, beautiful uh, mechanism over here. Then milk, uh, mostly mother's milk, but then they found, found that the uh, animal milk as well is very useful. It has components in it that can activate the NK cells. So that is very decent. Then a number of studies also show that alcohol com consumption or caloric restriction can actually demodulate the NK cell behavior. Then they continue and I believe they talk about vitamin A as well. Vitamin A causes the modulation of NK cell behavior. So that is also another supplement. Uh, overall, they say overall the experiment results suggest that vitamin A may be involved in the fine tuning of T cell differentiation into T reg regulatory cells and NK cell tolerance. So that is interesting. Vitamin D as well. So these are the supplements and the foods that um, can help activate the NK cell. So I would like you, if, if possible, please read through this, uh, this, this study, beautiful study. And great question, Cindy. Paul says, and I think Paul has a number of questions. So I'm going to go down to the very first question from Paul and then uh, come up. So in chronological order, Paul is saying, many informed cool beans are taking a wide variety of powerful antioxidants as prophylaxis and potentially early treatment. Is there a risk of too much of a good thing and causing dysregulation of the immune system that is inhibit the innate respiratory burst defense? So for all of us to talk about what Paul is uh, referencing, what happens is, look, let's say this is our cell. This is our cell. And let's talk about a neutrophil because he, he Paul talks about respiratory burst, neutrophil. Neutrophil or macrophages have these respiratory bursts in them. What that means is that they have vacuoles or they have small bags. In those bags, they trap the pathogen, for example, viruses. And then they make bleach inside the bag. So imagine it is like if you have a small bag at home where you capture some viruses and pathogens, you put, that, put them in the bag and then you burn them inside. So this is exactly how our neutrophils and macrophages kill the, the pathogens. They trap them in small bags called vacuoles or lysosomes, and then they make bleach, and then they throw bleach on the, on the pathogen, and pathogen dies. In this process, reactive oxygen species are created intentionally to kill the pathogen. So this is called a respiratory burst by a cell because it uses oxygen. It create, creates reactive oxygen species, which then kills the pathogen. So, Paul, when we take antioxidants, they usually do not go and take care of the or destroy the reactive oxygen species that are contained in various uh, various lysosomes. 
similarly, we know that uh, reactive oxygen species are being produced in the electron chain as well in the mitochondria. So usually antioxidants do not go and destroy them. What happens is antioxidants pick up those reactive oxygen species that, that have escaped the cell or that are present in the cytoplasm of the cell are just roaming around, running around like crazy little monsters and, and damaging the cells and tissue. These are the ones that are neutralized. So mostly the reactive oxygen species are not the one that are being used are usually not uh, neutralized. It is the runaway reactive oxygen species that are found here and there, which are killed by the antioxidants. Now this, uh, I would just make one more comment over here and that is, this is correct. And Dr. Paul Merrick talked about it as well when I interviewed him, that when we are taking a lots of antioxidants, maybe one or two are sufficient to take care of the situation and the rest are just of no use because one or two have already taken care of the situation. So taking too many antioxidants may not be useful, but no, they will not go into the cell and kind of uh, cause too much of neutralization of useful reactive oxygen species. Then if I continue up here, this could lead to extensive endothelial injury. Could the hyperinflammation of excessive AT2, AT1 cause proptosis? Pyroptosis means cell death or apoptosis of the cell. When lots of cells die, that is called pyroptosis. So if so, could that explain the lymphopenia? So the um, reactive oxygen species can, uh, actually the virus itself causes lymphopenia for SARS-CoV-2. But the uh, if I probably cannot get the correct uh, context of this question, but we also know that angiotensin II when we have viruses present, it binds with the ACE2 enzyme that causes the ACE2 function to deplete, which causes angiotensin II to increase. And angiotensin II is pro-inflammatory. So that mechanism that you're talking about is correct. And that would lead to the endothelial damage. And we have talked about it uh, many times. If you wanted to watch that video that I've done it, that video contains the word hypercoagulability in the title. There are two videos I've done that. Uh, Paul continues and says, could the main driver of COVID-19 pathogenesis be the RAS balance due to the overstimulation of AT1 from excess angiotensin 2 and the lack of this? That is correct. And that is what we talked about in hypercoagulability state. What happens is normally ACE2 and ACE enzymes uh, function is kept in balance. So the production of angiotensin 2 and production of angiotensin 1 to 7 are in balance. When the virus arrives in our body and binds to ACE2, that reduces the conversion of angiotensin 2 to angiotensin 1 to 7, which causes angiotensin 2 to increase, and that then causes all the inflammatory issues. So very good question. If the hypothesis is correct, would an ARB restore the RAS balance? So we just did this discussion, I think, a couple of days ago that there is a new study that showed that folks who are on ARB or ACE inhibitors who were already on them, they are actually better protected by the from the SARS-CoV-2 as compared to previously we were thinking maybe it, it, it works or not. So this is correct. Then there is another question here. Would an NLPR3 or NLRP3 inflammation inflammasome inhibitor prevent the paraptosis apoptosis. So yes, so I have a study over here. This study here. Um, so here is a study that says recent advances in the mechanism of NLRP3 inflammation inflammasome activate activation and its inhibitors. What does that mean for the cool bean over here? We have an NLRP3 mechanism that is pro-inflammatory. So anything that is anti-inflammatory over here, if you give an NLRP3 inhibitor, that would reduce the inflammation. And yes, that can be useful. But we have so many other tried and tested anti-inflammatory systems as well. This is a possibility as well. So that is a good question. I love it. Now, continuing on to the other questions, there is a question from Pizzo. I take vitamin D, and uh, my apologies if I mispronounce. Um, I take vitamin D, 8 to 9,000, and K2, 120 microgram, and supplements, also NSE. Shall I continue taking K2 while sick, or shall I stop it due to coagulation? So the 
this cannot be a general answer that one should stop or not. If a person has become sick with COVID, and if they are going towards hypercoagulable state, then it is actually important to have the D-dimers and ferritin and C-reactive protein labs done. And based on those, one should know that, do we need to anticoagulate or not? So uh, I cannot say deterministically that we should always stop K2 or we should not stop K2 because I do not know what is inside the body at that particular time. Labs will be needed. So that means your doctor plus labs will provide the answer. Good question. This is a good question as well from Roshan. He says, Dr. Bean, can the common supplements like magnesium, zinc, vitamin D, vitamin C have an adverse effect on creatinine level if taken for a long time, like four to five months? So I did not look at all of the supplements, but for example, vitamin D, I have a study over here. Uh, short term vitamin D receptor activation increases serum creatinine due to increased production but no effect on the GFR. So what they're saying is that some people have been saying that if you take too much vitamin D, that can cause increased creatinine, which is an indicator of the kidney damage. So this study over here shows it is not actually the kidney damage. Kidneys are fine. Glomerular filtration rates are fine. It is just that the vitamin D increases the creatinine production. So at least with the vitamin D, I would say that no, it's not an issue. I'll have to look at the other ones as well, but I just looked up one to be able to provide an answer. So uh, then Tenzo Kanj says that uh, comment on this one. And here is the uh, comment. I think this is Dr. Zev's, uh, Dr. Uh, Zelenko's. My study currently under peer review, 84% reduction in hospitalization, five-fold reduction in death. And so, yeah, I, I like his uh, study and... Um, we have talked about this in our Twitter discussions as well. Let, let this be, uh, I think maybe we should talk about this study at some point as well. Uh, but good study, I, I believe in hydroxychloroquine. Then continuing on, K-pop super strong. I just want to know about if there are any more updates on math plus protocol and how is it gonna help on preventing more deaths on a second wave? So it is interesting for me, what is, interesting is math plus protocol is a robust protocol. I know many ICU doctors use Maduri protocol, which is mostly composed of steroid usage. Math plus protocol also has steroid usage plus some more things for COVID-19. I think it should be used more often. Their data shows that they have a lot of success with it. And then Oxford study shows that steroids are useful. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Richard Bartlett's work shows that steroids are useful. So I do not know why there is a hesitation to use math plus protocol, but it is a very good protocol. And the, the strength of the math, math plus protocol is it goes from prophylaxis all the way down to the ICU management. So it kind of covers every phase of the disease itself. So I love this protocol. Then there is a question from Tenzo. Um, that lironlimab and HIV. So I have been keeping myself nowadays focused on uh, COVID-19, but there have been a couple of questions about HIV, then cancers. So if cool beans, if you would like, we can start doing some, maybe once a week, we can diversify ourselves from the COVID and talk about cancers or HIV or other such topics that you decide. So Tenzo, I'm gonna, at this time, I'm gonna keep myself away from answering this question because it would take us in a different direction, but it is a good question. Luke Henry says, do you think that people who contract the coronavirus but have no symptoms at all will always be asymptomatic or symptom free for life if they are exposed to the coronavirus over and over again? So my answer is no. And the reason for that is that our immune system's behavior and its condition changes. For example, imagine if I develop diabetes today, my immune system before today would have been okay and let's say not dysregulated. But if I become diabetic today and if, if I do not control it, my immune system is gonna fall apart. So it really depends what is the nutritional status of the person, what is the geography of the person, what is the stress level of the person, what is the sugar levels, what is the glycation levels, uh, if, the, if there are any cancer genes, if there are any other viruses present at that time that have dysregulated the immune system, are there any supplements that are 
uh, uh, optimizing or not optimizing the immune system. So immune system is not is constant throughout. It actually changes minute by minute. So to say that if I could defeat the virus today, then I will be able to defeat the virus again. That may not be the right one. I can say this, that if the immune system is healthy and I get the virus today and then the virus is taken care of by the immune system, then I should have coverage for many years by that immune system. But if during that time, unfortunately, I develop some kind of a disease, some immunosuppression, some immunodysregulation, then all bets are off. So good question. A possibility, according to Dr. Mubin Sayed, people who had SARS-CoV-1 had immunity for about three years. He expects the same with the version of SARS-CoV-2. The original SARS-CoV-1, I think, died out, and he thinks the second version will die out as well if enough people are vaccinated. So that is correct, and I stand behind my statement. And luckily, when I had said this, that was about four months ago. I remember when I said it, the discussion at that time we, we did was the reinfection. And in that, I said that if you look at the SARS-CoV-1 and MERS-CoV, there were no reinfections and the viruses were taken care of before the reinfections could occur because protection was for three years. And I had shown some studies with that. So uh, I stand behind my comments. And luckily, nowadays, we are seeing for the last three, four days, if you watch my videos, we have been talking about those um, studies that are showing that we have immunoprotection, not only by the B cells, but also by the cytotoxic T cells and also by the innate cells as well. So I think we are going to come out of this evil time very soon. And when we come out, this virus will be eradicated because most of us, if we had not automatically gotten the uh, immunity by re receiving the virus, then the vaccine would help. But I think we will be able to come out of this virus very soon this virus era very soon. Pezo says, can you please have a look at Peru? So yes, uh, I did not know this. So here is John Hopkins. This is Peru. Peru's population is, I believe, 30 million. Um, I had looked it up. I believe the population is 30 million. And I am actually surprised and saddened that they have half a million cases, 27,000 deaths. And if you look at the graph over here, it is not letting up. They are still uh, in a bad state. So the question is, can you please look at Peru? Herd immunity does not seem to be there at, at all to me. Also, as far as I've seen the news and forums, Sweden changed policies and people were also getting the virus more and more seriously, but it was not covered in the news that well. So um, I have to do some more study on Peru to be able to talk about what is going on there. But looking at the data, I feel sad that this, for a small population like theirs, it seems to be an aggressive uh, virus spread. So uh, Pizu, I'll have to look at it a little more and I'll talk about it. Paul says, Paul Elkins, what are your thoughts regarding lactoferrin potential role against COVID-19? And he has uh, put the study over here. I put that study out there too, and I have it here. So lactoferrin as a potential preventative and adju adjunct treatment. So I looked at the study itself, and it is actually very, very interesting. Lactoferrin is part of milk as well. So it's a non-toxic glycoprotein. Glycoprotein, we have talked about it. Uh, it is a protein. That means these are amino acids, which is glycated. It has some glucose attached to it. So if I make that over here, so glyco, there are two names, glycoprotein or proteoglycan, proteoglycan. And my apologies for my handwriting. When I'm writing like this, these are the prescriptions. So the, the handwriting is not the best. So if you look at the second word, it is a protein. This one is a glycan. So what it means is the first term, glycoprotein, it's a protein. That means it is made up of amino acids. And then it has some glucose attached with it as well. This is called a glycoprotein. On the other hand, gly proteoglycan. So the second word is glycan. That means there are sugars, many sugars or glucoses, and then they are attached with a smaller number of proteins. So these, these would be called proteoglycans. So now the question is, what is lactoferrin? Lactoferrin is a glycoprotein. So it has a structure like this. It is a protein which has some glucose attached to it as well. And it is available in supplementation. And I went over the study and I looked at it, how, how it works. So 
what it does is it is in mammalian milk as well is a broad spectrum antiviral plus it is anti-inflammatory as well but this study that they show over here is in vitro so that remember ivermectin started the same way there, there was an in vitro study only so i would not discount it but i agree with the with the uh, commenter that this may be an interesting um, supplement to take as well so good one lactoferrin does seem to be very useful drew says uh, Gartner protocol examine the proposed mechanism we have done ivm we have vitamin c revisit as a combo sure so uh, adam gartner has his own protocol as well so please take a look uh, Pezo says should you take copper too if you take zinc as prophylaxis so very good question so let me just very quickly explain this copper first of all copper can be very poisonous if taken in higher doses it can actually accumulate. It can actually appear in the gums. It can appear in the uh, in the lens of the eye. It can cause severe dermatitis. It can cause many, many uh, toxic things. So please do not take copper in higher doses. Having said that, copper does have antiviral effect. So copper surfaces actually have less virus that stays on them. And copper is important in our body in the normal, uh, uh, what is that, normal quantities that we need. And what happens is something that is interesting for cool beans for us over here is that copper. So let's say if this is intestine. This is the small intestine. Copper and zinc are absorbed. Copper and zinc are absorbed from small intestine. And if we are taking zinc, then it is possible that the zinc will inhibit or compete with copper and reduce the copper absorption. So the study here that um, I have uh, is copper here. This study is copper beneficial for COVID-19 patients. They, they talk about copper being an antiviral, which is good. And they talk about copper able to kill the viruses inside our body as well. But they talk about it can be very poisonous too. And finally, this is an interesting one. Because copper and zinc are competitively absorbed from jujunum, so jujunum is actually the second part. So this is du duodenum. And after the duodenum is jujunum, this area. These both are absorbed from there via metallothionine. High dose of zinc can result in copper deficiency in healthy individuals. And then it is possible that the people may be at risk of severe COVID-19 who are also taking zinc supplementation. So with this, Look, they're saying while high copper levels can be poisonous, sites which are copper limited can result in stress response to pathogen that causes the, um, so they're saying that copper should be maintained. So here they've talked about the dose for the copper. Once again, please talk with your doctor. Do not take these things by yourself. And copper especially can be very uh, poisonous. This model, so they have a study here. They say this model indicates that for humans, the optimal intake level for copper is 2.6 milligram per day. The current United States recommended daily intake is only 0.9 milligram, whereas dietary study indicated that even 1.03 milligram of copper per day might be insufficient for adult men. So this is the um, this is the dose they talk about for copper. But generally, the takeaway for us is that if we are taking too much zinc nowadays because we want to have zinc, then it is possible that we might be becoming copper deficient. Now, please remember, copper is usually in sufficient quantities in our food, and it is rare to become copper deficient. So do not over, do not take too much copper. But yes, copper can be useful and needed. Um, so very, very good question. Then this is a, also a very interesting question. And I, I think that cool beans, we should also discuss this together. What is this is, how is it determined if anyone has T cell reactive immunity against SARS-CoV? Is it like antibody tests or more complex? Is it available in regular clinics or labs? So what do you think? I, I had just responded to this one a few minutes ago as well. Cool beans. Is it easy to test all arms of the immune system? I'm looking at the, I'm eyeing the, <laughs> uh, the comment stream as well. So uh, it is not easy to have tested all these three arms. 
So that is the unfortunate part so far. And I'll come to the questions in a second. So uh, SAG Leos, no, it is not easy to find the other things. The only thing nowadays we can easily do is that we can talk about antibodies, but we do not have a way to talk about innate arm or we do not have a way to measure cytotoxic arms response. So then there is a question here about chlorine dioxide. And this question has been asked by many, many people. And I do not know what has prompted that. I wanted to make sure that we are very much aware chlorine dioxide can be really fatal, can be very damaging for us. So please, please do not take chlorine dioxide. So coronavirus COVID-19 update. This is FDA one seller marketing dangerous chlorine dioxide products that claim to treat COVID-19. Please don't take chlorine dioxide. It is very poisonous. It is, yes, it is viricidal and bactericidal, but outside, don't take it. This can actually kill a person. So I wanted to show you this. Here is life-threatening adverse effects of chlorine dioxide. Respiratory failure caused by serious condition where the amount of oxygen carried through the bloodstream is greatly reduced. Meth hemoglobin. If chlorine creates meth hemoglobin, that means the hemo it gets attached to hemoglobin and then hemoglobin cannot carry oxygen normally, and that person can die very quickly. Changes in the ele electrical activity of the heart, so QT prolongation, life-threatening low blood pressure, acute liver failure, low blood cell count, severe vomiting, severe diarrhea. So please, please stay away from chlorine dioxide products for COVID-19. It's of no use. It's actually dangerous. Then uh, question, if T-cell, so this is Arbella on slow, if T cell immunity to COVID can be greatly effective, especially in asymptomatic mild cases, is there an increased risk for those who have tonsillectomies? So she's saying that she doesn't have the tonsils and would that uh, uh, cause her immune system to be less responsive? So very good question. And uh, I would take this opportunity with this question. Tonsils are just one place where the uh, lymph tissue or the T cell B cells live. T cells and B cells are produced from the bone marrow. Tonsillectomy has no effect. Bone marrow produces the T cell and B cells. T cell then go to thymus, get trained over there, and then spread in the body, plus go and live in the lymph nodes, including tonsils. And similarly, B cells are trained inside the bone marrow, and then they go and live in the, the spread in the body as well, plus they live in the lymph nodes, including the tonsils too. So even if the tonsils are removed, tonsils in adult life are useless anyways. So when even if they are removed, that actually is not a problem. In adult life, tonsils actually become a target for bacteria to live in. So uh, you are not at a greater risk. At least you're not, uh, Arbella, you're not at a risk of, uh, Arabella, you're not at a risk of reduced immune response because tonsils are re removed. Ronald says, uh, Friday Forum Toronto Nursing Home. So there is a video he has attached. So uh, cool beans, you can watch this video. What they're saying is that there is a um, there is a nursing home where ivermectin had been used prophylactically for skin conditions, and then the outbreak occurred, and those patients who were taking I ivermectin were spared. So that that is a very good thing actually, and we know that ivermectin does that kind of a response. So good good study. Thank you for um, sharing that here or the video. Tony says. What are your thoughts on recent studies around bradykinin stone? So there are a couple of folks who have asked about bradykinin. We have not talked about bradykinin. The, we, have, we have talked about uh, renin angiotensin system. We have not talked about bradykinin and calicurin system, which is another system which is active in our body and uh, kidneys are participant in it. That system is also just like angiotensin one and two. That system is also used for uh, blood pressure maintenance. Uh, Tony, this is a larger topic. I will do a separate lecture about it, that how does bradykinin and uh, calicrin system work together? But good question. Luke says, if and when COVID-19 is defeated, can we work on beating cancers? Absolutely. If the cool beans over here, if we agree to continue discuss discussions after the COVID-19, I would love to have you with me. Then we can talk about cancers and we can talk about other diseases. Um, Lectures on SARS-CoV and coagulopathy, and I have done multiple lectures on that. Please look at my videos, which contain the word hypercoagulability, and that is 
where I've discussed this. Thoughts on flu vaccine. So Willow Desk says, thoughts on flu vaccine this year being more important. It makes sense and all. Just wanted to hear if you had any additional input. No, flu vaccine should be taken because uh, I would not want us to become doubly impacted by having flu and then having SARS-CoV-2 as well and having an issue with that. So flu vaccine should be taken. The last talk you had with Dr. Patterson, he, so this is Joel Tejero. He mentioned about the effectiveness of pulse oximeter. So very good question. So Joel is saying that what is the role of pulse oximeter? Can you expand further? So look, uh, when we talk about this stages, these stages, viral stage versus immune stage. And remember that once we shift from the viral stage into the immune dysregulation stage, that is where the patient starts becoming severe and critical and um, unfortunately some die as well. So when I had been talking with Dr. Bruce Patterson, I had asked him a question to say, how do we know at home that we are in the viral stage or we are getting into the immune stage? And he said oximeter. And that is a beautiful, small and straightforward answer. Oximeter will tell if the oxygen levels are continuously going down. That means the patient is moving away from the viral stage and moving into the dysregulation. So uh, Joel, uh, the point Dr. Peter Patterson was making is you do not need to have sophisticated labs around you to figure out if you are in the viral phase or getting into the immune phase. O oximeter reading can give you a clue. So what does that mean if the oxygen saturation is continuing to drop from, let's say, 97, 98, 99, which is normal. If it starts dropping from there to 96, 95, 94, 93 is the cutoff point to be at the hospital and uh, start seeking the medical help. But if you see the saturation is going down and continue to go down, that is your help by the oximeter to say you are moving into the uh, immune dysregulation phase. So good question. Raza says, what is your latest view on, on if long hauling is caused by latent active vaccine or overactive immune response. So Raza, I still do not have more clarity on this. I still am in the same boat as before, that this seems to be either the remnant of the virus staying in there, or it seems to be a dysregulated immune system, or it seems to be the tissue damage that is taking some time to heal, or a combination of all of those. I have to find some studies where we can figure out exactly what is going on. So this is also a question about AIDS. So we'll keep the AIDS and cancer separate for the time being. Then further questions here. And I'm sorry that I am so many minutes into the discussion and we are still just going through Twitter. I promise I'll come back to these if you are OK to continue the discussions. Uh, if you felt that, hey, you have you are done, then just tell me and I would stop. Here is Dr. Husani who says, when India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh having more frequent exposure to uh, infection, HCOV, why not their immune mechanism overcome to this SARS-CoV? Whereas in Steve, uh, Sweden, graph is better than those in. So India and Bangladesh have not looked in more thoroughly. So I cannot comment on that. For Pakistan, I'm seeing actually that they have almost uh, gotten out of the situation. So if we go here for John Hopkins, and if I look for Pakistan, here. So if you see here, Pakistan has about 300,000 cases and only 6,219. 6, Again, I should not say only, even one death is a lot. But if you look at their graph, they are getting out of it. Their deaths are reduced. If you look at their uh, um, daily cases, they have reduced. and even now, I was talking with someone. They were saying that Corona ward, wards are being closed. I have a Urdu language interview tomorrow for one of the Pakistan's channels. And the, they had sent me a question to say, can you please talk about it? And their question was, hospitals are closing the coronavirus's wards. What would happen if there is a second wave? What would happen if we have it? And I think that they have it under control as well. So I look into India and Bangladesh separately. So. Uh, can't comment on that for the time being. Uh, Gajnan Kulkarni says, why U.S. is doing so poor in terms of number of recovered cases? 
India 70. So if you put both of these questions, they're kind of opposite to each other. India, 74% uh, people recovered. Russia, 80% people recovered. Brazil, 81%. Canada, 90%. While US, only 34% people recovered. So I don't think that we are doing great in US. Maybe just like one day I became frustrated with WHO and I just did a video about it. Maybe one day I should talk about US and what we are doing incorrect over here. Um, many people respond to me and say that we have more cases here because we are doing more testing. Otherwise, it is fine. I don't look at the number of cases. I look at the number of deaths. And when somebody compares US to Sweden or US to another small country, that is an incorrect comparison. Any comparison, even within US, various states and geographies cannot be compared. So any comparison is wrong. I get it. But if you're going to compare US and compare it to some other country that has similar population, we have countries like India, where population is in billion or more, and they have lesser deaths. China has lesser deaths. Uh, other many other countries have lesser deaths. So US, uh, forget about the number of cases, because as soon as the number of cases come up, then people start saying, well, we are testing more. That is why we have more cases. Fine. Look at the number of deaths. Deaths are not interpreted or influenced by the tests done. Deaths are deaths. So uh, we are not doing great in the US. I hope we become, we go on the right track. There are some states that have go gone towards the right track. There are some states that are still not. But um, I wish and pray. I'm an American as well. I feel bad about it. Every day I come in here and talk about how to manage ourselves and how to protect ourselves. And my own country is not in a good state. So um, maybe, Gajanan, I should do a thorough discussion. I have been avoiding this topic because I think my frustration would show. and. I'm trying not to not to become too not to show my emotions and and remove the scientific discussions that I do. But maybe I should do this discussion someday. Dr. Husseini says, if we would have cared elder and most elderly patients, then we would have been saved many lives. That is correct. If we um, if we protect, and I've been saying it four or five months ago that we should try to protect the vulnerable first and then others, even for the lockdowns and even for the uh, social uh, support. For example, in, in US, uh, they, there were checks sent out to people. I believe that we should take the uh, vulnerable community first and support them to fullest extent, put all the resources there and then look at the rest. What is the role of naso, uh, nano sponges in COVID-19? So we had done this discussion, uh, Dr. Husseini, once time in the past as well. There's a company nearby in San Francisco, I believe. San Francisco is about 40 minutes from my home. I'm in Cupertino, California. What they have done is they've created small nanoparticles that can go and sponge up the virus. I haven't seen more from them. That is a good uh, uh, hypothesis. That is a good technology how useful it is and can it be used successfully there is no trial yet that i can follow up on avox says all i can think of uh, so there are two questions so far is a bad one it's known that plants can pass along immunity or signals to get ready so avox has this uh, little uh, video over here or gif over here where one bacteria comes near another bacteria and they share plasmids this is how bacteria tell each other how to protect themselves. Most of the time, plasmids are small DNA rolls or rings in a, in a bacteria that contain uh, information to kill viruses. And then when bacteria come in contact with each other, they can make these conjugal tubes and through them they can share the plasmid DNA and give each other the resistance. So uh, AVOX's question is a beautiful question that do humans do it? So my answer is, not in this way, but uh, we know that we can take plasma from one person and give it to another person. And that is a very similar thing like this. Or we can put drugs in one from one person's antibody and we can make them and take them to another person. So we just need 
medical staff to help with this. And we don't have a conjugal way of uh, conveying uh, resistance from one person to another. We can convey, unfortunately, infections from one person to another, but not the, the protection from one to another. Uh, Gajanan says, I saw a number of cases growing in Australia. Does this mean winter will bring second wave in India? Winter is coming. So good concern, right concern that in winter, the humidity would reduce, which would increase the virus spread. So uh, that is a possibility, but it is still need to be seen. I think in Australia, it is not just the weather. It may have been people's behavior change as well. So Gajanan, I'll do some more studies on that one. Uh, Helen Knox says, question, what's stopping those whose immune system is taking the TH, TH1 route from developing the cytokine storm if they are not getting see This is a beautiful question. I love this question. This would be another question that is uh, worthy of an award. So what she's saying is this. We know that folks who go this pathway, they develop cytokine storm. Why is this pathway only resulting in mild symptoms and a quick uh, correction of the virus or control of the virus? The, the reason this is a good question is that this pathway have cytotoxic T cells. Cytotoxic T cells are like uh, army men who have to fight with each other soldier. So they have to face a soldier and then they have to fight with that soldier. So it is hand-to-hand -hand fight. It is boxing match between the immune cell and an infected cell. On the other hand, B cells are like tanks or, or missile la launching system, which would just throw thousands of missiles and can destroy whole cities and countries. So because B cells release chemicals, that is like chemical warfare, they can spread throughout the body and then those antibodies they release can activate the inflammatory systems. These can cause damage to the endothelium, damage to the other widespread area of the body and cause inflammatory reaction everywhere. On the other hand, cytotoxic T cell, when they get activated, they do not spread out that fast and they cannot go to every cell of our body and start fighting with them. Otherwise, our body would double up with the number of new cytotoxic T cells that is developed. They do proliferate, they do become a lot, but still they cannot cause harm like chemical warfare that B cells do. So very good question. This is why uh, cytotoxic side does not cause uh, cytokine storm. Caroline says, remdesivir has been praised as a good treatment, yet many doctors and studies have shown little benefit. Have I missed something? I'm wondering, is there a reason other than political financial remdesivir would be promoted while hydroxychloroquine and convalescent plasma are discouraged or prevented? So we know this. This is not a new thing. I don't think that remdesivir has shown its efficacy to the level that it has become, it became uh, approved so fast and it has been used. I don't think that it has shown the results the way it has been supported. And at the same time, she, uh, Carrie Lynn, you're correct, then uh, that other drugs, for example, hydroxychloroquine, have been suppressed. Uh, I don't know if this is really suppressed, opposed, but there is a mess in hydroxychloroquine world. Um, convalescent plasma are discouraged. Conv convalescent plasma, I'm going to talk about that in a second as well. Um, then Caroline has one more question on convalescent plasma. From what I understood, it showed promise if given in the first three days, it makes sense that antibodies won't work once the disease has progressed to the immunological stage. However, doesn't it make sense to keep it as EUA? Why? within three days. So absolutely correct. So I'm going to go back to this phases here. This is why I had drawn them in the beginning. Look, convalescent plasma is useful in this stage where the virus is present, as you say in your question as well, where the virus is present. And then if you give antibodies against the virus, virus has to be present to take care of it. If we give convalescent plasma at a stage where the virus is really not the important one, but it is the immune system, then those antibodies are going to go into the body and just run around and do nothing. There'll be no virus or very little virus to take care of. Uh, but if you said that, should this be part of the uh, standard uh, treatment? Yeah. So either convalescent plasma or monoclonal antibodies or polyclonal antibodies in the viral stage, 
should be very useful. I agree with you. What are your thoughts on Kaneen? So um, <clears throat> Kaneen is from which um, hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine are derived. So Kaneen is also something that is used for uh, malaria. However, Kaneen is much more toxic, just like chloroquine is very toxic. So don't take Kaneen. If you have to take something, then hydroxy is a better, safer thing. Even then, hydroxy is also um, dangerous, but not as much as Kaneen. Relogero says, could you make some research on chlorine dioxide? So I just talked about it. Please don't take it. Uh, question, Raza, what are your thoughts on bradykinin storm? So I, I said in another question as well, I'll discuss bradykinin storm separately. Dr. Husseini says, this is the last question on Twitter, and then I'm going to come over to the feed. Some COVID patient responded well to hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, BCG, MMR, remdesivir, monoclonal antibodies, and supplements, etc. But in my observation, we have saved many lives with steroid and low molecular heparin. Your views, please. I totally agree. I had done one discussion in which I said with lots of uh, humility and with uh, with this disclaimer that this is not a prescription for anyone. I think the whole stage can be taken care of with steroids. Early stage, uh, Dr. Richard Bartlett's budesonide, budesonide and later stages, methylprednisolin and long hauler, Delta Cotrel. These are all steroids. So steroid here, inhaled. Steroid here, IV or oral, depending upon patient state. And oral steroid here. And that actually takes care of the whole spectrum. And that is what I'm seeing in many of the countries I discussed that they have gotten things under control. So Dr. Husseini, your comment is correct that many of the countries other than US have actually just deployed uh, azithromycin, hydroxychloroquine, or uh, Ivermectin and doxycycline with a regime of steroid, and they're doing fine. So with this, I'm going to come over. My apologies to the live stream over here. Let's look at the questions. <clears throat> are you OK? So we are seven, one hour, two minutes into it. Are you OK if I continue? So Guy Teffler, does IgG antibody become AS2 receptor? So there's a question, does IgG antibodies become ACE2 receptors? No, they do not. Um, then let me now scroll up and I see, I'll try to see the word question. Increased deaths can be, do you feel favipiravir? So there's a question from Dr. Mahesh. Do you feel that favipiravir is a really game changer if it's used in the early, very early stage? I definitely believe that, yes. And um, I'm going to look into some of the studies as well with the usage, but I believe in this uh, drug. A uh, question, Paul says, isn't COVID a con convalescent plasma mechanism of action antibodies? If so, why is it being given in the late stage after viremia is cleared? So Paul, you're absolutely clear. Uh, you're absolutely right. When we are not in the stage of viremia, then it's not necessary. It has to be given when the uh, virus is present. And so if it is used later, that is incorrect use. That is a wastage of convalescent plasma. Um, questions. Guru Gil says, is there any chance you can do a well-explained video on different forms of particular vitamins, min minerals, B12? Um, sure. I have been nowadays very much uh, focused on what cool beans need is for uh, COVID, but if uh, if you guys all want, I can continue with the vitamins as well. Maybe that is a diversification. We talk about hypertension and we talk about um, diabetes, cancer, HIV, supplements, foods, minerals. We can do that. Okay, so question. I'm looking for the word question. Question. Chantal says, have you heard of the flu cases being down this year due to COVID-19, where most of year to nearly all suspected cases of flu are coming back as being COVID-19? So uh, <clears throat> very good question. I was actually thinking about this yesterday as well. Uh, flu is happening still, but the number of cases are less. And I think some of those numbers are misinterpreted as well. And then we have been in, in the lockdowns. We have been super hygienically 
sensitive as well. We've been trying to stay away from as well. That would actually reduce the flu spread too. So ideally, the flu should actually be less this year. Um, question is by Adriana. Is it true that hydroxychloroquine is no longer banned in France and that a significant drop in hospitalization deaths was seen? Adriana, I have not seen this, that is it banned or not. I would re research that and respond to you. That's a very good question. I thought it was still banned. Um, so Mary says this, I don't understand why hydroxychloroquine has had studies that show ineffective, yet here it, it is regarded as effective. So Mary, this is a very fair and valid point that hydroxychloroquine studies, most of them have shown that it does not work. And I think that if you look at those studies, I've talked about them in the past. Some studies used, for example, Brazilian study used chloroquine. Chloroquine and then the dose of chloroquine was so high that it caused so much damage that they stopped it. That was a stupid study. Then the study done on veterans here, that was a retrospective study which did not have the right dose and right time of using hydroxychloroquine. Plus, it didn't have zinc, it didn't have uh, quercetin. So that was a retrospective but really incorrect way of looking at hydroxychloroquine or even administering hydroxychloroquine at the late stage. It's not useful then. Uh, similarly, the other studies, for example, part of the recovery trial, they had hydroxychloroquine dose, which was like 2,400 milligram daily. That was bound to cause damage. And then the reasoning, so I went over the study and I found out the reasoning was they were giving hydroxychloroquine in a late stage and they were saying that patient is not doing well, so we're going to give a lot of hydroxychloroquine. Dudes, think you are giving hydroxychloroquine in, in immune dysregulation phase. What is it going to do? It is going to be acting on the virus itself and that has to be early on. And even when you give it in the early stage, don't give it in that high an amount. You're going to kill the patient. So that was also an incorrect use. Then there was a study that was run about hydroxychloroquine with zinc and azithromycin. In, uh, it was an over the internet study. And that said that it doesn't work. And I think that most of that was they had not tested everyone. I think they tested 50% of the patients, number one. Number two, the whole thing was subjective. They had sent out the drugs over the internet, over the postal service recruited people over the internet and then, then just ask subjective questions. So I thought that that study itself was very weak, but the design was interesting. I'm still scrolling up. I'm going to go down in a second to see if there are more questions here. So uh, Mary, you are correct. And if you say that over here, do you mean that uh, with the cool beans group? Uh, I have seen it working by myself. My patients have become um, cured with this. None of my patient till today has gone to a hospital. And just because I take a very aggressive, very early stance and I prevent my hope and my prayer and my management approach is always, I'm not going to let them reach a point where they become immune dysregulated and end up in the hospital. So hydroxy is a good weapon to use in the early part. Okay, so, all right, so I'm going to go to the end of the questions here. Question is by Rick. Did you did you know that what Dr. Paul Merrick and the critical care doctors are using quercetin instead of hydroxychloroquine? So uh, I had a very detailed discussion about it, and we have that discussion in uh, our interview as well. Dr. Paul's point of view, Dr. Merrick's point of view is that hydroxy has become such a religion and there are so many studies contrary to it, and there are so many studies for it. And uh, Mary, while I respond to you, I forgot the biggest bad study that was by uh, this surges fear fraud and this uh, Sapan and the whatever hydro, uh, Harvard's cardiologists. I have lost so much respect of these people for what they did. And the whole thing was a fraud. I'm still waiting for someone to go and make them accountable for what they did. And they caused WHO to go wrong. They caused the new cycles to become wrong. And they caused so much damage. Who, who is here to go and talk to them and say, what the heck did you do? 
So back here to Rick. Um, so uh, Rick, because Dr. Marek's point of view was that because it has become a religion and there is no not sufficient data to say let's use it or not, uh, he had kept it out of the protocol. And I don't blame him. Uh, it has just become a point for fighting. One news media says it is bad, and the other news media says it is good, and one person says it is. They're not looking at the mechanisms. The mechanisms are in the book. They show it. So forget about all the politics and look at the mechanism, and that mechanism is shown. Even when I had done the mechanism video, do you know that it that video went viral, and it I think it had, in 24 hours, 1.6 million views, and that then it was removed. Um, so question, Kim says, Madagascar was having good luck with the herb Artemisia. Do you know anything about this? So Kim, I had been asked many times to look at Artemisia. My problem is that I cannot look at things for which I cannot understand their mechanism. So if I just started saying that, yeah, it seems like it is fine, but I cannot understand how they work, then I am at a loss to be able to convey that message on. Um, this is why I could not um, talk about it. So Caroline, you're correct. OK, so James calls his question, can glutathione decrease cancer cell death? So glutathione is a very potent re uh, reactive oxygen species uh, killer. So the cancer cell death, whenever, so glutathione would help reduce the reactive oxygen species, which are part of the inflammatory response if there is a cancer that is going on. So when somebody has cancer and that area has the fight going on, any um, attempt to reduce inflammation and uh, immune system response can actually be dangerous. So there's a comment, Dr. Mobin, thank you for your frank opinion. I can't read, I believe this is Korean language. I can't read your name, but uh, I would have wished to. I love Korean language. Thank you for your frank opinion about using the hydroxychloroquine in the early stage. You're, you're most welcome. Um, so Barbara says that what steroids for the long haulers? So I have been using, again, this is not a prescription. Please don't take this. This is a disclaimer here. Your doctor should tell you what to do. I use Delta Cotrill 5 milligram for my patients. And my regime is I give them 5 milligram for two days, Delta Cotrill 5 milligram morning, lunch, evening, two days. Then for two days, morning and lunch, five milligram Delta Cotrill. And then for two more days, just mornings, and then it, that's done. That is what I use for long haulers. And so far, everyone who was complaining after a couple of months that I'm still having fatigue or myalgias or I keep getting cough, uh, this has worked. Um, question and please if i have missed somebody's question that is not because of any bias that is just because i have one stream over here and i'm trying to find questions and the stream is moving as well so it would just be my mistake to uh, to miss it not any bias somebody had left a comment that you always leave my questions out that's not my intent um as Pomonako says, I'm a med student and I'm due to go on clinical rotation soon. Should I defer a year and wait for the situation to improve? I'm worried about bringing the virus home to my elderly patients. So <clears throat> this is the same answer which I give for the children as well, that please protect yourself as much as possible. Now, doctors and students, especially medical students, those medical students who've been studying, of course, now we have about, about a million folks who are around us from medical schools. I tell them not to go yet. So this really is your personal choice and your decision. I won't stop it. Doctors are needed in the hospitals. We have to be on the front line. We don't have a choice. But students, anybody who is a student who can have a choice of uh, uh, staying at home and protecting themselves and their loved ones, they should do that. I am not for youngsters to be exposed to um, a bad state. All right, so uh, so one more thing about the long haulers. 
Dr. Paul Merrick said that statins are very useful because they are anti-inflammatory as well. So Kyler Bond says, I want Dr. Mubin Sayyid to be my doctor. Set up a WebMT account, please. OK, very good. Will do. Thank you very much. Uh, Prednisolone is being used with a good result. Yeah, so Delta Cotrell is, is a similar thing. So Anthony says, what is the name? Delta Cotrell or Prednisolone? They are similar. So there has been this question about the Russian vaccine a lot. Is the Russian vaccine that's being rolled out the same type of vaccine as the UK Oxford one? So yes, UK's Oxford vaccine is an um, adenovirus, modified adenovirus. And Russian vaccine, I have heard is the same. I haven't found any data. Many people have asked me, why don't they talk about Russian vaccine? I just don't see the data. So all I can say is it is an adenovirus vaccine, and they are saying it is working. I don't have any data to talk about. So how can I stand behind it or, or not behind it? I just don't have the data. Uh, I think doctors need to cooperate with America's frontline doctors to adopt the using of ICQ in the early stage. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm, I'm with you. Is there any study on the, uh, is there a, are there any study in the use of steroid and hydroxy? No, I am not aware of it. Question. All right. <clears throat> so David says, JAMA concluded that remdesivir demonstrated no significant survival benefit and it is the first EUA drug. What are your thoughts on lirolimab being the next drug to be FDA approved? So in my opinion, remdesivir has not panned out. And I feel, so this is my feeling only, the mechanism of action of lirolimab, to me, it seems like it is a promising drug. Their uh, mild to moderate, I think that the, the one for which they have come out with the results, the primary was not significant, but the secondary, which was actually for hypoxic patients and, and patients who were deteriorating fast, it actually worked very well. And their severe, I think, is using that as a primary. So in my opinion, they have something. Uh, what I cannot tell is why are they not getting approved? And I don't know if it is politics. I do not know if it is a drug not uh, valuable enough. No idea, but it's strange for me. It is a similar thing that remember when hydroxychloroquine discussion started. Hydroxychloroquine was rejected to be approved, but remdesivir came up. It also had similar rumors at that time it can help, and it got approved like this. And even now that we see that it is, it doesn't really work very well. It is still going on. So I don't want to wear a tin foil hat, but there seem to be some not very professional behavior by some authorities. Um, Paul says, would a diet high in saturated fat cause one cellular lipid membranes to include more SF and therefore be more resistant to viral fusion and or protective against ROS? So uh, <clears throat> the reactive oxygen species actually cause more damage to lipids, they create reactive lipid species, plus they cause phospholipids fusions. So um, as long as we can protect against the ROS production by supplementation, I think that would be a better route. NYTM says, do you think herd immunity of COVID will be achieved globally before useful vaccine? I think so there is a very interesting comment somebody put in today. And in context of our discussions yesterday, a day before, and the day before, many areas only show herd immunity of 10 to 20% by antibody measurement. And they still show a decline in their death rate. Forget about the new cases. People say we test more, and so the cases are more fine. Look at the death rate. They are going down. I think that those 10, 20% antibody, the remaining 30, 20, 30% is coming from T helper cells, sorry, sorry, cytotoxic T cells and innate arm. So I think there will be enough immunity produced that the virus spread would become so slow that mm -hmm. with the social distancing and with the masks and with other parts of the protocol of social behavior, we would actually get out of this situation. Having vaccine would help us accelerate getting out. If we get a vaccine in another month or two, that would 
push the population, let's say another 10, 20% of the immunity, and then we'll be home free. Valerie Rhodes, question, can you comment on uh, previous attempted RNA vaccines, Dengue, for example, that have failed and made exposure to native virus very dangerous? Why should this vax be any different? I have a very simple question for uh, answer for this one. <clears throat> this specific vaccine that is being formed, it is against an RNA, but the amount of research and the knowledge of this RNA, the whole world at this time is focused on this one. And because of that, the RNA uh, components that are being built in the vaccine are actually very similar to the way the virus itself would have arrived in our body. The difference only is that when virus arrives in our body, it would come with its whole mechanism and the whole genome and with the enzymes that would cause it to replicate. And the vaccines are actually bringing in a part of the virus without the replication process. And so uh, it actually just creates spike protein. So this is why I believe this RNA vaccine is actually going to work out. Now, RNA vaccines, the, uh, the lipid particle vaccines, have not been very successful before because of the dengue's resistance. That is where I cannot yet comment until the vaccines have been trialed. So from a mechanism point of view, I think it would work fine. From the behavior of the virus, dengue's virus developed resistance because it changed itself. I had done a discussion that uh, SARS-CoV-2 is trying to change its spike protein as well, but it cannot change it sufficiently to not be to be able to continue spread and also not become uh, dysfunctional. Here is the thing. Imagine if I'm SARS-CoV-2 and my hands are my spike proteins. If I develop, <clears throat> if I develop some sort of a, a mutation in my spike protein, and let's say this hand is necessary to grab onto something. So let's say this is something to ACE enzyme to grab on. And now my hand cannot open at all. Then I cannot grab on. So the, the problem is that if the virus changes itself enough that it can it, it cannot just even bind, then it is going to be useless. So as long as spike protein stays intact in the virus, these vaccines will work. Now, will the lipid particles work or not? These are newer vaccines. I will wait for the trials to see how do they come up. So far, they've been successful. Good question. I, I can't read the tea leaf. I can't say what would happen in the future. But the way I'm seeing these vaccines, these are going to be OK. You are very welcome. All right, so no more questions here. So Jim has a question. Is it possible that olefin might work? Um, Jim, I have to do some research on it, on olefin. So olefin. I'll, I'll look up. Thank you. <laughs> so this is the first one that I have no idea. So somebody is saying you explained your belief. OK. Um, so time warp. Thanks, Dr. Bean. Have you had patients come to you with mild symptoms as a result of using the zinc, ostein, NSE, and D3, and any other prophylaxis? Most of the people who have been in touch with me, they know what I propagate, that we need to take um, these things and, and we need to stay hygienic. We need to wear masks. So most of my patients have been in that kind of a mindset. And so uh, I have seen rarely patients, but I have managed patients who actually had to go to hospital there for example, in one case, the oxygen saturation was down to 86%. And they went to hospital. Hospital refused them that they didn't have place for, for a bed. And they came back. And I still remember that when they called me and they started talking with me, uh, I could hear in the background people crying in the home. Because with 86%, they knew that he's not going to survive longer. We started them on hydroxy and other re regime. And they, within two days, Oxygen saturation came back to 89 and 90, and then the person uh, recovered. And he had cancer as a comorbidity as well, and he recovered. Similarly, there was another patient who was 
in a state where oxygen saturation had gone below 90, couldn't get a place in the hospital. And then I started managing them. And thank God that uh, within three or four days, he was fine. And he actually went back to wherever he had come back to a to their family home and then he went back to his own home so um but other patients i've seen them are in the initial stages humberto says can children be treated with hydroxy or quercetin so quercetin we eat all the day onions have quercetin apples have quercetin blackberry uh, sorry strawberries have quercetin so many food items have quercetin so quercetin can be given but those had has to be adjusted. <clears throat> Hydroxy dose has to be adjusted, adjusted with the body weight, retinal situation, uh, blood situation, and the heart. So I am very, very careful with the um, hydroxychloroquine. And my, uh, my apologies, I'm, I'm, I'm stopping every so often. I'm in California. We have fires here, and there is so much smoke all over. <coughs> that it makes breathing a little difficult. Um, hydroxy has to be my way of giving hydroxy is that I usually, before administering hydro hydroxy, I ask for heart rate and breathing rate and I take vitals. Then I give only 200 milligram and I ask the patient to be monitored for the whole day. If everything stays the same, then I give them one, one another 200 milligram and then monitor them the next day as well. If heart rate starts going up and down, I stop it. But if it stays consistent, then I continue for the rest of the days. Chantel says, thank you very much. You are very, very welcome, Chantel. So let's take a couple of more questions, and then we stop. It's one hour, 30 minutes. Uh, David Chan says, how likely is it for COVID to mutate to a much more fatal strain? How quickly can a virus mutate? Very good question. And interestingly, I have done this discussion many times. And even now, after yesterday's discussion, where I said virus may have become weakened, some folks left some angry comments that I do not understand how the virus weakening works. So let me explain this once more. Look here, let's say this is the coronavirus, current strain. And this strain has a property that it can actually go from one person to another, it can bind to ACE2 receptor, it can enter into the cell, it can cause the disease, and in some patients it can cause the uh, cytokine storm. Now let's say this virus arrives in my body. When the virus arrives, they change all the time. Within one person, they mutate. So let's say the mutation is one generation created, which is ditto similar to the parent. So that virus will have the chance to continue to spread and cause disease just like its parent did. Then let's say there is another mutation in which the spike proteins have become modified and they are not the way it, they used to be. So if the hand has to be open, they have become closed hands. And now this virus, even in the same person, cannot bind with the ACE2 anymore and it cannot enter into cells and replicate, it's gonna die. So this is a weak virus that would die then it is possible that there is another strain within my body which has correct spike twos, but the enzym enzymatic structures have changed. So this is a weak virus as well. This might spread to another person, but it, if it cannot do its replication or other things, this would die as well. So weaker virus, <clears throat> which is disabled virus, will die. But a weaker virus, which has adapted better towards us, for example, it doesn't cause enough immune dysregulation, or for example, it doesn't trigger enough of the immune system's responses, then our immune system would calm down and this virus would have a chance to live in us and spread more easily. On the other hand, if this virus also have another species, which is much more angry and much more um, <clears throat> dangerous, and let's say it can bind more efficiently, it can bind with more kind of receptors as well, and it has more enzymatic changes that it can really attack our system, then the person in which it mutated, it might kill that person, plus the person, if it moved to another person, it would kill them as well, and so in that process, it would die as well. So a virus, to be able to continue to propagate, the ideal situation for it is to become adapted to our system so it doesn't kill us, 
but still have the capability of continuing to spread in whatever way it wants to spread. So let's do one last question. <clears throat> Valerie Rhodes, comment please. Elderly gent had mild hospitalized COVID-19 and then sent to rehab. His nursing home won't let him come back until negative test. He has languished for weeks. Is this right? So it's a very specific condition. But if I had the nursing home as well, I would like the patient to be um, risk free for the others because the nursing home patients of people in there are at a very high risk of catching the virus. So in a way, they are trying to protect the others. I would have wished that maybe there is a setup where there is a close by house rented in nowadays in a special, these special cases that nursing homes should have some stations rented separately where sick COVID-19 patients can go there and nursing home staff can help them there without bringing them back into the nursing home and risking the other population. Secondly, the staff should also be separate for the COVID-19 patients so they do not go to the patient and bring it back to the, uh, uh, to the nursing home. Now, the criteria for somebody to be declared free is two RT-PCR negative 24 hours. Uh, if they are negative, then that person can be taken as free. Or the other is to maybe put them in quarantine. But if he has already recovered, and if two RTPC are not negative, then that should be OK. Deep says, hi, Dr. Bean, a fan of yours. I like t the, your TH diagram. Could you please create a similar diagram that shows all the major immune components? We'll do. Let's talk first about the uh, complement system, and then we'll do this diagram. Last question, Marco Lencion. Do you think pregnant women would be able to take Evipedil? I have not looked into that. Ideally, it's an immune regulator. Uh, Marco, I'll have to do some re research on it because it is still in trial. The point of the trial is to figure these things out. So from mechanism, they don't tell it. But from trial, they would explain. We give phase one and two trial do not even go near pregnant women or people with any comorbidities or people with uh, age brackets that may not be healthy age brackets. So th phase three would include such folks as well. So they are not in that stage yet, to and we don't have that data yet. So good question, though. So thank you very much, everyone, and have a good day. Uh, talk to you tomorrow. Maybe we should talk about complement system tomorrow to complete the immune system picture, or maybe some other thing, uh, and we'll go from there. Please, in the meantime, I think we are nearing the end of this situation. Keep yourself protected. Don't become restless. Don't go out too much. Use masks. Keep your hands clean and washed. And stay away from others. Just a few more months, and we'll come out of it. We'll come out of it together. I hope that I am protected in this time as well. I hope you are protected in this time as well. See you tomorrow. Love you all. Stay safe and happy. And please like, subscribe, and share. This is such a long video. I think nobody else is going to watch. But anyways, I think there is some useful uh, information in here. So thank you very much.